My daughter, Linda, is making me laugh here. Uh, I'm trying to calm down. Paul established the church at Corinth. Acts 18, he was scared spitless. And the Lord came to him and told him, don't be afraid. That church broke Paul's heart. They were divisive in all kinds of ways. They competed with one another. They looked down on one another, depending on who had the best gifts and all of that kind of thing. And they really were a torment to Paul. But he says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, 25, look, take care of one another. Look after one another. Don't, don't be divided. Earlier in chapter 11, they'd all gather together, as many as did, gather together those who were the halves and who had food and all of that, wouldn't wait till they have nots to get together so they could all eat together and then move into the Lord's Supper. And it was creating serious division. It wasn't a doctrinal issue as such. Though even treating one another right is a teaching doctrinal issue, but it wasn't theology that was creating the division in 1 Corinthians 11. It was that they weren't caring for one another. He said, stop it and don't be divisive and help one another. 1 Corinthians 12 spends a good bit of time on that. Uh, I'm wanting to say that Paul knew what it meant to need and not get help. He knew what it was to need and get help at critical moments in his life. He, he was a tough, a tough man. As a young fellow, he stood there watching, holding the clothes while people were murdering Stephen. And then after that, he was a high energy fellow. And he traveled all around the country and then headed up to Damascus uh, to kill uh, and uh, torment Christians that they might recant. This was a hard man. And when Peter wouldn't behave himself down in Antioch, Paul chewed him out. And when Barnabas, who was his closest colleague in ministering the gospel, when he had an argument with Paul over Mark, the argument became so fierce that they divided one from another. Hmm. And they both went their own separate ways. Turns out that Barnabas was right about the reliability of Mark, but Paul wouldn't have it. For Mark walked away in the middle of a, uh, a mission trip, and Paul said, you're not going with us. And that's what started the argument. Hmm. And then if you read the book of Galatians, the fella was utterly inflexible when it came to the gospel. But because all of that is true, you tend to think that Paul was an iron man, and that's not true at all. In the, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 21, everybody saying goodbye to him. He said, oh, stop it. You're breaking my heart. Hmm. And he writes to the Philippians about those who had walked away from the gospel and who were not good people. He said, I'm telling you, weeping that these fellows are, uh, they're not servants of God. They, uh, they serve themselves. I get no pleasure. It breaks my heart. That's the case. And in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, he writing to Timothy, he's now in Rome and he's going to die. This, this will be his last letter. And he said, uh, all of those in Asia, they deserted me, turned away from me. And he names two big hitters there. This is 2 Timothy chapter 1. And it hurts him sore. And then in chapter 4, verse 10, he talks about uh, Demas. He said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved the present world. Hmm. Everything in 2 Timothy is sadness and heartache. And when he writes to the uh, Ephesians in chapter 6, 10 and following, he tells them that we're fighting 
not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You remember how that text goes. But in verses 19 and 20, he who was, was well armored with the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel on his feet, the helmet of self, all of that he had, and he's telling all of them, be sure to get all of this. But in 19 and 20, he said, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me that I might be bold and that uh, I might speak boldly as I should. And then after the shipwreck and the, and the boat and all that kind of thing, he ends up down there in Petoli. He's heading for Rome for his last meeting with people in this world at this time. And he's very much down in the mouth. And a number of fellows came to meet him, a number of brothers came to meet him a long walk all the way to the three taverns in the Appius Way. And when they met Paul, the scripture says that Paul saw them and thanked God and took heart. Hmm. He said in 2 Timothy 4, everybody in Asia left me alone. He said, because God didn't leave me alone. He, he's always there. But though he knows God is always there, it doesn't mean he wasn't lonely. Read 2 Corinthians 6 and 2 Corinthians 11. This was a tough, tough man, Mark Hill. But you can be tough and lonely. You can be tough and down in the mouth. You can be all of that. But in the middle of all of that, in 2 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, and you can hear his tone when he's saying, everybody abandoned me. And then he says in 2 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, but the house of Anasiphorus, or Anasiphorus, if you prefer, the house of Anasiphorus, he said, God bless that entire family for that man. You must remember, he said, how much good he did for me while I was in Ephesus. <sighs> and he said, and when I was in Rome, in prison, in Rome, he searched for me. This is 2 Timothy 1, okay? He said, he searched for me uh, hard, diligently. He searched for me, Rome in that day, and it depends who you're reading. Some people do studies on these things. Um, the minimum figure I read was that uh, at least one and a half million lived in Rome in Paul's day. I've read figures up to four million. Just make it a million and a half, all right? A million and a half, that's a big time. And they didn't have streets the way you and I, uh, no streets. Well, there were a couple of streets that were well known that, but, but this, these cities weren't built that way. Hmm. So here comes this fella, Anasiphorus. And uh, he's now in Rome and he can't get a, a road map by it. He doesn't know where all the streets are. So he has to work hard. To find this man, what man are we talking about? We're talking about a criminal. And Paul in that text that I'm, I have in mind at the end of 2 Timothy 1, he said, he wasn't even ashamed of my bonds. So you need to picture this fella. He, uh, he, he finally gets to Rome. And he's going around everywhere and saying to people, uh, can you tell me how I get to the prison or something like that? Well, what are you going to, what are you going there for? Well, I've got a friend who's in prison and he would tell them and he's got to search and search and search. He looked for me diligently. 
he said, and find me. Wouldn't give up till they find me. And that, and you can hear, you, you must read the New Testament as much, you and I must read it as much as we're able in such a way that we're, we can imagine that we're there. It isn't question, a question of lexical work and grammar and syntax and all of that. It's that these are stories, but the story record. Hey, hey, listen, the story record, what we read in the book is the rehearsal of actual events. To get a real sense of Onesiphorus is to imagine yourself being lost somewhere in Europe or somewhere in Asia, looking for someone that you knew was not well received in the city that you're in and you're looking for him. And how long did it take him? Who knows? This we know. He headed to Rome to find a fella in prison sought him diligently, lifted his heart. And now when he writes the last letter, he's going to write this hard man. You can hear him say, I thank God for this man. It wasn't the first time he did it. When I was in Ephesus, you know the stories, how he helped me. A big strong man like that needed his help. And there lies one of the secrets of the strength of a local assembly, if there is to be strength in a local assembly. You can, I can, you can, we can help an assembly to be strong if we don't presume on the strong to do all the carrying without any help. Help the strong to be strong. Help the men and the women who are able to stand in the middle of awful trouble. Be sure that they get help because if indeed they are the strong and the influential people, it's the weaker ones among us that they're helping. So when Paul would say, help one another, he's not just saying that the strong help the weak. He was certainly is saying that. But he's telling the weak, help the strong, give them some encouragement. Because when they carry the burden, it gets on top of them also. They may not show it as much, but it's happening. And I don't care how confident a humble man or woman uh, seems to be. I don't care how strong they seem to be, how well they're hiding. Well, you know that. They're not bragging. They're not swaggering. They're not doing any, anything like that. They're thinking, I need to be strong for my brothers and sisters. And because they are like that, the weak among us need to be uh, thinking. They need help too. Well, what can you do? You can pray for them. You and I can look around and see these people and think of how Paul's situation was and how Anasaphorus knew this man needed help. And every now and again in the text, just read Paul as a biographic um, a person. Hear about his sorrow. Hear about his loneliness. Hear about the times of hardship. Hear about the times when he comes to the Lord Jesus in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and says, I'm having a really, really, really hard time with this physical disability. And I need you to get rid of that. And the Lord said, what you need is my grace. That's all you need. And you need to know this, that my power, my power, it's probably the Lord Jesus. There's a little bit of debate. It's not God the Father. It's the Lord Jesus speaking uh, to him. And uh, Jesus will say, my power is made perfect 
uh, it's shown and seen and more influential in weakness. This is the one who was hanging on the cross. And they would have said to him, when we hang you on the cross, that'll be the end of you. And he would say, mm, no way. When you hang me up there, that's when I'll begin. For I will draw all people, men and women, unto myself. And he said that 2,000 years ago, and he's still doing it to this day. And the central thing we talk about, the central thing we talk about in the Christian faith, though it must always go along with the resurrection. We must never take the cross not in light of the resurrection. They must all be taken together. But the cross is what calls people again and again and again. The resurrection doesn't show the love of God to us as it, as it should, but the cross does. We, we sense God's kindness and his care and all of that in the cross. And Jesus is saying to Paul, who has had a long time suffering with this serious disability and is now begging, please take this away. And the Lord said, no, uh, it's the weakness uh, that shows my power best. And Paul then says, well, if that's the case then, but he did want right about so all the strong people that you know, the strong men and women who put up with hurt and harm, family harm, marital harm, um, economic harm, whatever harm it is, and, and still they influence and carry themselves as strong people and um, centering in the Lord. Give them a break, will you? For if they collapse, if they become liabilities, the congregation will suffer. And if that were to happen throughout all the congregations, the, the church of God would just descend into weakness. Brothers and sisters need to be helping one another. The strong will help the weak, but the weak must also help the strong. And there's something that, look, look, kindness. I'm not talking about sweet, syrupy, this, that, and the other. I'm talking about strong a genuine thankfulness to people who have been good uh, for us in life. Yeah. Um, um, and I've forgotten his name, and I was going to tell you about it. It'll come to me in a minute. He's uh, the Irish writer, Oscar Wilde. Hey, I normally forget him. Oscar Wilde wasn't a very nice man. There were aspects of his life that were just very wrong. He was a sexual predator and homosexual. That was a major part of his behavior. He was also on the arrogant side. But that wasn't the whole story about him either. There was deep down in wild a sense of God. And he was just carried away uh, in life by things that got on top of him. Well, in any case, um, the, the world in that day in Britain, you know, the world loved him. He was the golden boy among all the dilettantes and all of the, the celebrities. Everybody wanted him until he had this argument with the, uh, the father of a young man worse than him. Uh, and he had to go to court and uh, he was found guilty of perverting uh, the young and all of that kind of thing. And he ended up in prison, Reading Jail in England. And this is a fellow whose life was soft. Everything's clothes were marvelous. Everybody wanted his food was this, that and the other. And he went to prison and it was torment for him. One day a fellow came to visit him. Um, I've been a, a friend, a, a, a close friend of his. And the friend uh, said to him, um, most of what they're saying about you, well, he didn't use the word most now that I'm telling it to you. He didn't say the most. He said, what they're saying about you lies. 
envy, bitterness, vengefulness, all of that. He said, that's what they're saying about you. And Oscar Wilde turned to him and said, listen, some of what they're saying, it is what you say it is. It's vengeance and bitterness and all of that. He said, but it's not all that. What they're saying about me is true. I have been wrong. I have done wrong. My ruin is my own doing. I have done wickedness and evil. And if you, see, this is a lovely remark here. He said, if you will not receive me as that person, then I'm telling you I was. You and I can not be friends any longer. I must confess who I am and you must receive me as I am. Hmm. That says something about Oscar Wilde. But in, in the course of him being there, he wrote a thing called De Profundis, out of the depths. He got it from the heading of a song where the psalmist speaks out of the depths. And in the course of it, he tells of a day when he was coming through uh, the corridors in the gloomy um, court buildings and all the all the uh, newspaper guys were there and, and there were jeerers there, people there who were there to mock him and see how uh, far he had fallen from his majestic status. He said, I, I had my head down, I, I could hardly bear it. Bear in mind now, this guy was treated marvelously and now he's being treated like you know, the rank and file diner in the gutter. Some people get used to that. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying the people who are poor and impoverished and pushed around and oppressed and that, some of it, some of it, they become used to. They don't expect anything kind. But for a fella whose life has been marvelous, I'm nearly done. Isn't that good news? Uh, but for someone whose life has been marvelous, to sink right down into the thing is not only pain, it's worse than purgatory. He said, I was walking down the corridor in the gloom with all of the jeerers and the picture tickers and all of the rest of it. And a man stepped out into the middle of the corridor and tipped his hat to me and bowed his head to me and a mark of respect and a token of acceptance with him. He said, people have died and gone to heaven for less than that. He said, what he did reminded me of what the Christians, the early Christians did when they met up with the lepers and would kiss them and take their hands refusing uh, to be distanced from them. And this man, he said, it opened up my heart that all the bitterness, or much of it, that all the bitterness out, his act of kindness redeemed me from my hatred of fellow humans made me realize that there's another world like, unlike the world that I was now experiencing. Hmm. That happens all the time. We talk about betrayal. We talk about people abandoning others and that happens and you know it and it happens with Christian people. Someone screws things up 
badly. And they are abandoned uh, by brothers and sisters even. I've made a lot of mistakes, she says, and I, I went, this is a woman telling me her story, made a lot of mistakes. I, I went to the assembly, they checked out my background and because of my background, they said, well, we can't fellowship you here. Another lady, some, yeah, I'm, what I'm telling you is true, I'm embellishing nothing here. A number of years ago now, what, 15 years, maybe? Oh, no, 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 longer now. A lot of years ago, a girl came to me and said, could you, would you speak to my mother? I said, what, what's on your mind? And she told me the story. Uh, the mother, uh, her husband had died. It broke her heart. And uh, she hadn't assembled for many, many months. And the eldership there, sent her a letter telling her if she did not come back to assembly, they were going to withdraw from her. I don't know who they were. But I know what they did. Look, I went to see her and uh, we talked our way through it. And I told them they were wrong. Break your leg and have uh, one of those where the bone a compound fracture, that's, that's it, isn't it? Where the bone shows out through. If, you, if that happened to you, if you tripped over and that happened, everybody would be bringing you flowers. They'd be praying for you to do all of that. Get a broken leg, get a broken neck, get a broken back, get a broken foot, get a broken something. But this lady had a broken heart. And they never took it into account. How dare they? Abandonment can happen. But what happened there to Oscar Wilde and what has happened to me, a lot of people have come into my life down the years, said they were going to stay, and they stand. And it keeps you on your feet. Paul said, be good to one another. He said in Philippians chapter 2, have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Though existing in the form of God, he didn't think equality with God was something to be greedily held on to. But he emptied himself, took upon him the form of a servant, became obedient, even unto death. Death on a cross, a Roman cross, incidentally. He said, have that mind in you. We were all in trouble. Couldn't do anything about it. Because we were all wicked and the, the world in which we lived was wicked. We helped to build it. And then we puked up our own configuration of wickedness and bitterness and resentment. The kind that you see right this day all across the USA. All of that going on. And then there were world living in alienation from him. God came in and as Jesus Christ to give us help and calls us brothers, Hebrews 2, 10 and following. For he who sanctifies, he who makes holy, and those that are made holy, they're all of one family. Wherefore, he, Jesus, is not ashamed to be called their brother. There's a serious worm feeding at the center of the uh, people of God. Among others, I mean. This worm is individualism. We don't see ourselves. We don't see ourselves as a nation. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, a nation, a people who one time were not a people, but now are the people of God. We see ourselves as a whole series of individuals. There's no sense that if one of us loses, we all lose in that respect. Or if one wins, we all win in that respect. We're one nation. And by the time that Balaam 
um, was convinced by God, you get up and speak about Israel. Balak said, these people need to be killed. Balaam said, I need to make money of these people. And God said, here's what you'll say about them. I saw them from the crags. This is Numbers 23. I saw them from the crags. I looked down on them. And behold, a nation that lived alone, not counted among the other nations. And of them in that same place, he says that God says of them, how beautiful are your tents, O Israel. There's something savagely wrong with individualism. And if you can't help me when I'm in trouble, and I can't help you when you're in trouble, if we are not committed to one another as a nation, we're not like anybody else. We're not swaggering. We're not arrogant. We're not morally better than the good people in the world. We're not. But we're not like any other nation. You don't exist alone as a Christian. I don't exist alone as a Christian. I exist as a Christian because I'm in Christ along with so many others. The Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, baptized us into, it's baptism in water in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I'm not interested in debating that for right now. That's a nice discussion. But the Spirit of God baptized us into one body. Christ is the Savior of the church, which is his body. You don't exist as a Christian without me, nor I without you. And if you will not have me, you cannot have Christ. And if I will not have you, I cannot have Christ. We're all in this together who trust our lives to Christ and give them or not a shot by his grace uh, to do what we need to be doing. Well, we'll blunder, of course, of course. But though we blunder, we cannot live sinning with a high hand. And one of the high handed sins is rejecting our brothers and sisters. Division, heresies, standing apart one from another. We can't have that. I'd love to be, want to be, hope that when I die, there will be someone who can seriously, this is what I want in God and need prayer, my own and everybody else's, that, that when, I, when I leave here, that there might be someone who will be able to say, not just because they're sweet and kind, and you know how we do that, we say sweet and kind things that we didn't think, but I mean that, that someone who could regret my leaving, someone into whose life I uh, came, and instead, uh, I want to be like Onesiphorus. I want to be like the fellow who met up with Oscar Wine in a corridor, stood right in front of him and said, oh, and Oscar Wine said, I don't even know if he knew that I saw him do it. I want to be like that uh, fella. And if I can, at least I'm contributing then to this nation. And people will look at this nation if they see us in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? He said, you know, if you love one another, do you know what they'll know? They'll know that, uh, that you're my disciples. That's not the only thing he said. There are truths that must be taught and stood by and we will not walk away from them. But all the truth in the world, all the theology that's correct, all the academic skill, all of that, is no substitute for loving one another 
on giving one another a break. Eh? God bless you. God richly bless you.